now your host for Sports Talk. Please welcome owner and founder, Ed Boston. All right, wait, well, we'll start with the music in the background, the little technical glitch there to start with, uh, only because the last time I used my Spreaker Studio, we experimented with Auto DJ, and so it was on Auto DJ still. That's a, see, note to self, you got to take it off Auto DJ or it stays. Uh, welcome to the show, folks, Sports Talk with Ed Boston. Uh, a lot of things going on in the world of sports, a lot of good things, a lot of not so good things. Uh, we got a big segment on professional wrestling to finish up the show tonight. Uh, it's going to take us through the uh, one hour mark. It's got so much to, to talk about there. And uh, of course, the NFL, we're going to look at the playoff picture we're getting we're getting down to the nitty-gritty um, teams have been eliminated teams are getting close some other teams jump back into the race and uh, wow uh, it's that time of year um, baseball and, and I got to tell you I've got a rant coming in, in the world of baseball you might if you know me and, and you know my likes and preferences in baseball you may guess what that rant is about. Uh, I won't even give you any good hints other than that uh, until it gets here. But I, I've got one of those. Uh, we'll look at uh, the NBA, college basketball, briefly into college football because we're in that little lull period between the end of the regular season and bowl season. Um, let's just jump right in and talk professional football, the NFL, the biggest sports league in the country. And, you know, that's really hard for me to um, to say because I'm a huge baseball fan, but it's the truth. The NFL is the biggest and most watched league in in. American sports. And let's go to last week, week 13. Week 13, let's get to the top. It was a it was an interesting week. Uh, some things happened that would make you scratch your head and say, how in the world did that happen? And then there was some things that almost happened that didn't happen. And Oh, well, let's go down through it. In last Thursday's game, uh, Green Bay beats uh, Detroit on the Hail Mary uh, 27-23. I got that correct. Um, Indianapolis lost at Pittsburgh 
and I need to get over here on another page. Um, Indianapolis lost to Pittsburgh. They got whooped by Pittsburgh, actually. And in the NFL, um, let me. Uh, you ever get frustrated at yourself? Nah, I'm sure you haven't. I do, though. Uh, and I had what I needed up and did some other things and it's gone I know the winners I just don't know the scores right now till I get this back over here uh, where I need it to be and I'm <laughs> I even have stuff saved that uh, that uh, still didn't give me what I need for right this very second. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Let's get the football, and then let's get the scores. I mean, I could tell you who won and who lost, but part of reporting on it is given the, the scores from, from last week. I mean, that wouldn't be true sports reporting, now would it? Okay. We got that Arizona, I mean, I'm sorry, we got that Green Bay beat Detroit, and I got that correct. Pittsburgh 45, Indianapolis 10. I did not get that correct. Buffalo 30, Houston 21. I did not get that correct. San Francisco 26, Chicago 20 in overtime. I did not get that correct. Sounds like a game show that we're on. Uh, Cincinnati walloped Cleveland 37-3. I got that correct. Uh, how many people were picking Tennessee last week? I did 42-39 over Jacksonville. Arizona 27-3 over St. Louis. I got that correct. Miami 15-13 over Baltimore. I got that correct. Now this is one that early in the year I would have predicted this, but Minnesota's been playing well. Uh, Seattle's not been playing so great this year. Seattle 38-7 over Minnesota. I did not get that correct. Uh, next one in overtime, the New York Jets 23, the New York Giants 20. Uh, I did not get that correct. Tampa Bay over Atlanta, 23-19. I got that one correct. In one that I should have picked the other way, I, I just, I've i lost on Oakland so many times this year by picking against them that I picked for them this week. Uh, however, Kansas City, 34, Oakland, 20. I should have stayed with the old, old picks. And picked against them. Denver 17-3 over San Diego. I got that. Now here's the one that you say, how in the world did this happen? As bad as Philadelphia has been playing lately, as pathetic as they have been, Philadelphia 35, New England 28. I hate picking New England to start with. I hate it even more when I pick New England and they lose. I mean, that's like a double whammy. I can't stand New England, and then when I pick them and they lose, that just sucks. Carolina, 41-38 over New Orleans. And in the Monday night game, if you remember last week, I said I didn't think Dallas would win again this year. Uh, Dallas, 19, Washington, 16 at Washington. Oh, It was an 8-8 eight and eight week for your host. And... Um, That brings 
my winning percentage down by a point to 61%. And I think I'm going to do this in a little different order than, than normal. Normally I go to this week's picks here, but I'm going to go with the standings. Um, the standings after last week's games plus the one game from this week that has already taken place. That game being uh, Arizona and Minnesota. Arizona won that game 23-20, to 20, uh, which I did pick that correctly, by the way, so I'm off to a win to start with. Uh, in the AFC East, we've got uh, New England at 10-2, and two, having lost two in a row. Uh, the Jets at 7-5, and five. Buffalo 6-6, six and six. Miami 5-7. and seven. That's a pretty decent division right there. In the north, St. Louis, or St. Louis, where am I going? The Cincinnati Bengals, 10-2. and two. Pittsburgh coming in second at 7-5. and five. Baltimore way back at 8-4. and four. And Cleveland even farther back at 2-10. and 10. In the ugly AFC South, my Indianapolis Colts and Houston are both 6-6, six and six. Indianapolis would get the tiebreaker right now because of their division schedule. Uh, so they're both 6-6. Six and six. Jacksonville, 4-8. and eight. Tennessee, 3-9. and nine. Boy, that is an ugly division. I hate to say that about my own team's division. In the West, Denver at 10-2. and two. They've been coming on. Uh, won three in a row after they lost a couple. Kansas City, 7-5. and five. They've won six in a row. And they are hot right now. Oakland five and seven, San Diego three and nine. In the NFC, Washington, Philadelphia, and the Giants all tied at five and seven. And a game behind them, Dallas at four and eight. Dallas at four and eight is one game behind the playoffs. That division is uglier than the AFC South. Uh, right now, uh, Washington must have um, the the tiebreaker because both they and Philadelphia are two and two in the division. But when it comes to conference standings, Washington is four and five and four. Philadelphia is three and six. So. Uh, it looks like Washington would take the tiebreaker right now. Uh, the rest of them would suck out when it comes to the pl- playoff wild card. Uh, in the AFC North or NFC North, Green Bay eight and four, Minnesota, who's lost two in a row now, eight and five, uh, Chicago five and seven, Detroit four and eight. Now we get to the remaining undefeated team. Carolina is twelve and zero and have a six-game lead over Tampa Bay and Atlanta, who are both 6-6. Six and six. Arizona has clinched a playoff spot at 11-2. and two. They are the tops in the West. Seattle, 7-5. and five. St. Louis, 4-8. and eight. San Francisco, 4-8. and eight. Um, Let's see... Those two clinched. I didn't notice if any AFC team. They are the only two teams that have actually clinched the playoff spots at this point. And Carolina has clinched winning their division as well. Uh, If the playoffs were to happen today, the four division winners in the AFC, division leaders in the AFC, would be New England, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, and Denver. I think you should probably put Indianapolis slash Houston because uh, they are tied and the second team in that division is not going to get a wild card. So uh, officially it would be Indianapolis, uh, but they are tied with Houston. So Denver, Indianapolis slash Houston, Cincinnati, New England. Uh, right now, 7-5 and five is the best... Um, Wild card records, that would be the New York Jets, the Pittsburgh Steelers, and the Kansas City Chiefs. 
if I were a betting man, which I am not, and if I were betting on who would make that out of those three, and I'm not, I would be betting on Pittsburgh and Kansas City. Uh, Big Ben's getting back in a groove, I think. Uh, Kansas City's won six in a row. Uh, the Jets, they're playing good football. Don't give me, you know, uh, I hate to pick the Jets, and um, so I, I don't have to. They'll play for that themselves. All right, well, coming up starting tomorrow, because, again, we've already had the the Thursday game this week, Arizona, again, 23-20 over Minnesota. We've got Indianapolis at Jacksonville. I always take my Colts, and I would take them even if I was being objective on that. Washington at Chicago. Who do you pick? I'm going with the home team, Chicago. In an upset, I'm picking Pittsburgh to win over Cincinnati. It might not be that big of an upset, uh, but Cincinnati is substantially ahead in the division. In in uh, in a game that the only people that care about are the fans of those two teams, San Francisco at Cleveland. Cleveland is at home, so I'll take them. San Diego at Kansas City. As said earlier, Kansas City has won six in a row. I say they make it seven over San Diego. St. Louis at Detroit. I'm sorry, Detroit at St. Louis. I'll go with the Rams. Tennessee at the Jets. I'm not picking Tennessee two weeks in a row. The Jets should win there. Buffalo at Philadelphia. Which Philadelphia team will show up? Buffalo is a decent team and Philadelphia beat New England last week. So which will it be? I'm going to go with Philadelphia keeping the the good play and flip a coin basically. New Orleans at Tampa Bay. New Orleans is just falling apart. I'm going to stay with Tampa Bay. They still have a shot. Uh, In my upset special of the week, uh, Carolina has already clinched the division. Uh, they really almost have nothing to play for other than home field advantage throughout, and they've got a two-game lead in that. Uh, I'm picking Atlanta to upset Carolina. And I know some people are saying, are you kidding me? No, that's what I'm picking. It's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, Again, in a, a game where which Seattle team will show up, uh, Baltimore is at home against Seattle. I'm going to pick the Seahawks. I think they're coming into their own a little bit. Uh, Oakland at Denver. I've got the Broncos. Dallas at Green Bay. I've got Green Bay. Now this is an interesting one. New England at Houston. New England is the road team. Houston is playing for first place. New England has pretty almost got first place wrapped up in their division. New England is minus... Gronk, Gronkowski, for those of you non-football people. Uh, And Gronkowski is injured. But I just can't believe New England loses two weeks in a row, even with Gronk not in the the game. Uh, So I'm picking New England. If you let me down twice in a row, New England, I don't know what I'll do. (laughs) And... Uh, in the Monday night football game, we've got the New York Giants at Miami. Uh, the Giants need a win in the worst sort of way. I'm picking the Giants, so that's a toss-up right there, too. Need to go back for just a second. I, I didn't do the NFC playoffs, and I also was a little bit confusing there at the end of what I said. Uh, the the wild card teams... In the AFC, right now, uh, there's three of them tied for two spots. Kansas City, Pittsburgh, and the New York Jets. I personally think it will be Pittsburgh and Kansas City uh, if things stay like they are. Of course, this could all change. Uh, And I mentioned I don't have to pick because they'll play it out. And 
they'll decide it on the football field is what I meant to say there. And so I get that I was a little bit confusing. If we were to end today in the NFC, which is what I forgot to say earlier, uh, Washington, Philadelphia, the Giants all tied. Washington would be the official leader. Washington, Green Bay in the north, Carolina in the south, Arizona in the west. That would be your top four. Seattle is at seven and five. Minnesota is at eight and five. That would be your two wild card teams right now. Still in the mix, Tampa Bay and Atlanta are at six and six. And pretty much everybody else don't have a prayer. It's almost set in the NFC. Um, So there is that. And now we move on to um, Major League Baseball. And Major League Baseball is... Uh, is where I have a gripe this week. Do I? Well, it's free agent time. And the way free agency works is is after you've been in the league a certain number of years, once your con- contract expires, you can declare yourself a free agent, meaning you can go to another team without being traded. And so we're in the midst of signing free agents. And everybody knows that my team is the St. Louis Cardinals, if you know me at all. And the Cardinals had a player who was the most sought-after position player, is what they're saying, uh, in Jason Hayward. Now, I have been a Jason Hayward fan before he became a Cardinal. And um, last year he played for the Cardinals, had a, a good season. He didn't have a, a huge season. He led the team in batting average, but it was less than 300. Uh, he plays excellent defense. Uh, he has good speed. He steals 20 bases at least a year. Uh, but they've just gone crazy with how much they pay these guys. I mean, it's been crazy forever, so this is nothing new. But let me just read you a post that I put up on my wall. And... Um, And if you can hear my dogs in the background, I apologize. They are downstairs, but Amy's not home. She's working a long shift today, and I can't go uh, fuss at them, or else you'd hear me fussing at my dogs. So maybe I'll just stomp on the floor a little bit. Hey, they must have heard. They shut up. (laughs) Um When we move, which we're doing shortly, that should get taken care of because the studio will be upstairs while we're living downstairs. And it won't be as... It'll be more soundproof, let's put it that way. Uh, Back to Jason Hayward. And what I want to do is just read something I put up on, on, on Facebook. Um... Let me read the story first, and then I'll read you my take on things. Hayward reportedly chooses division rival Cubs. Okay, let's let's break it down from there. Everybody that knows me knows that if there's a team that I cannot stand, it is the Cubs. So that is part of my irritation. So... uh, but I still believe, short of that, it um, that my points are legitimate about being upset over this. The Cardinals have been stung by their division rivals yet again as St. Louis's primary offseason target, Jason Hayward, 
has reportedly agreed to sign with Chicago, making the Cubs the only more formidable, making them only more formidable in the top-heavy National League Central. Uh, they signed David Price. They signed Jason Hayward. They signed uh, Lackey, and uh, so they uh, they're looking good. The Cardinals acquired Haywood. Uh, in November of 2014, hoping that having him play a season in St. Louis would sell the right fielder on a long-term fit there. And the, it was a short-term gamble. The Cardinals parted with 10 years of control over young pitchers T Shelby Miller and Terrell Jenkins for the chance at a long-term payoff. Well, that never happened with them. Uh, losing Hayward to free agency. While Hayward enjoyed his year with the Cardinals, he reportedly found Chicago's long-term offer more appealing. The Chicago Sun-Times and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch were among the first to report Haywood's final decision. Uh, here was the pluses for Haywood. He's still young. He's only 26. Uh, he, he plays as good a defense as anybody in baseball. Uh, he is above average in speed. He is above average in hitting for uh, average. But his power numbers aren't great. So my take on it was this, and I posted this on my my personal Facebook wall. Uh just as I said when Pujols turned down over $200 million and said it wasn't about the money, good riddance, Jason Hayward. You got spoiled by Cardinals Nation, and if your numbers aren't any better for the Scrubbies than they were for us, then the Teddy Bear fans will massacre you. I was a fan, and you're free to choose whomever you want. Just don't expect me to candy coat it and make things what they aren't. You are not a $200 million man, and I'm glad we didn't pay you that amount. And then I had some other things I wanted to say. And so I did that in the comments. Uh, a rookie for the Cardinals had this year that only played half the season. He played 82 games. Uh, Piscotti. 39 RBIs in 82 games. Hayward played 154 games, only 60 RBIs. Uh, the most RBIs that Hayward has had in his six-year career is 82. Second was 72. And the third best of his six-year career was the 60 that he had this year. Now, this is going to be old school right here, so... I said, people are acting like the Cubs got the second coming of Willie Mays. And at this point, he's not even the second coming of Willie E.T. McGee of Cardinal fame. In Willie McGee's first six years, his best RBI totals were 105, 82, and 75. Compare that to Jason Hayward's 82, 72, and 60. And did I mention a batting title, and an MVP award for Willie McGee. All in his first six years. That's comparing apples and apples, folks. And so, I'm off my soapbox, is what I said on there. But I'll stay on my soapbox here. There is... I seen where a lot of people were... Uh, well, the Cardinals better get on it. They didn't get their guy they wanted. Da-da-da-da-da. The end of the, the end of the world as we know it's coming. And... It's not. I mean, we need another bat. There ain't no doubt about it. But Hayward wasn't that bat that we needed. We needed him for his defense, his his uh, speed, and, you know, I think he's a good guy in the clubhouse. But as I said, good riddance. If you could come to Cardinal Nation and play for a year and not fall in love with Cardinal Nation... Then, then go play for the Scrubbies. I mean, go for it. You know, they're trying to buy a championship over there, just like the New York Yankees used to always do. That's what they're trying to do. Maybe they've done it. They were only three games out of first place last year. They beat the Cardinals in the first round of the playoffs. And so maybe by adding 
Price, Lackey, um, Hayward, and, and a few other m more minor players, maybe they've bought what they need. But here's one thing you can't buy, and that's team chemistry. You can't buy Cardinal Nation. And um, it just is what it is. And I hope the Cardinals don't break the bank with anybody that's left out there either. Because there's nobody that is that good. So there you have my rant for Major League Baseball. Let's look at um, uh, the ultimate free agent tracker. Uh, David Price, of course, we mentioned signed with Chicago. Grinky signed with Arizona. Hayward with the Cubs. Um, Zobrist signed with the Cubs. That was another one that they... Um, um, added and I believe that was a good addition for him. Matt Widers uh, stayed with uh, the Orioles. Jordan Zimmerman um, went to Detroit. Lackey to the Cubs. Samarja went to uh, San Francisco. Anderson re-signed with the Dodgers. Uh, Bien Ho Park, uh, Minnesota. Colby Rasmus stayed in Houston, and that's the top 25. Uh, still several of the top 25 hasn't signed. Uh, I'm kind of interested in Chris Davis if they don't have to um, give up uh, – an ungodly amount of money. He He's a power-hitting first baseman. they got Piscotti that can play right field. Uh, they've got other outfielders that can fill in if there's a problem. And so I'd kind of like to see him go for him. Uh, rumors have it that um, uh, the Cardinals are looking for Alex Gordon, uh, who uh, is a gold glove winner. So we'll see. And there's been some trades. Uh, let me see if I can pull them up real quick. In addition to uh, trades, in addition to the free agent signings, uh, they had the... Um, winter meetings in Nashville, Tennessee this past week. and um, So there was uh, there was some uh, action in the trades. Um, Charlie Morton was traded from Pittsburgh or or to Pittsburgh, I'm sorry. Um, industry sources implied that pitchers like Scott Casimir, Mike Leak, and others over the ten million per season are not on the Pirates radar, uh, but they do need more pitching, uh, which they presently have Garrett Cole, who is an outstanding pitcher, Francisco Lariano, and John Neese. Um, I tell you what, there were so many small trades uh, that went on. I'll let you look those up on Yahoo um, Sports or whoever you use for your sports. We're going to change over right now and look at uh, the NBA and we're trying to stretch this because I have a special guest I think that is going to be able to join me here for uh, the wrestling talk 
today, so I'll try to stretch this out till 8 o'clock, and we'll get into wrestling at that time. Oh, let's look at the standings in the NBA. Uh, in the Eastern Division, the Atlantic the Eastern Conference, the Atlantic Division. How about that? Toronto is uh, a game and a half ahead of Boston at fifteen and nine. Boston thirteen and ten. New York ten and fourteen. Brooklyn seven and fifteen. And Philadelphia has a win, but is one and twenty-three. Wow, what a ugly situation that is. Uh, in the Central Cleveland fifteen and seven, my Indiana Pacers thirteen and eight, Chicago twelve and eight, Detroit thirteen and eleven, Milwaukee is at nine and fifteen. In the Southeast, Charlotte fourteen and eight, Atlanta fourteen and ten, Miami twelve and nine, Orlando twelve and eleven, Washington is at nine and twelve. In the Western Conference, in the Northwest Division, Oklahoma City leads the way at 15 and 8. Utah 11, 10 and 11, Portland 10 and 14, Minnesota and Denver follow at 9 and 13 and 9 and 14 respectively. Golden State, we are 24 games into the regular season and Golden State still has not lost. Last year's champions are a perfect 24 and 0 at this point leaving them ten and a half games ahead of the Los Angeles Clippers who are in second place at 13 and 10. Phoenix, Sacramento, and LA. Phoenix is 10 and 14, Sacramento 9 and 15, and the LA Lakers on Colby's farewell tour are coming in at a whopping 3 and 20. In the Southwest, who many people probably figured this to be much tighter than what it is. San Antonio leads the way at 19-5, and five, which would be an amazing record if they weren't in the same conference with Golden State. Uh, Dallas, 13-10. and 10, Memphis, 13-11. and 11, Houston, 11-12. And, and New Orleans is 6-16. Six and 16. Let's look at the conference standings and see what where are the top eight teams, which would be the ones that would make the playoffs, um, stand at this point in time? In the East, it would go like this. Cleveland, Charlotte, Toronto, Indiana, Chicago, Atlanta, Miami, Boston. Is that eight? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Boston would have the eighth and final spot. And this year, it would be very interesting because usually um, somebody gets in in the East with a losing record, but Detroit and Orlando would not make it at this point in time, and they are both above 500. is Isn't that something? Uh, in the West, t- of course, topping is Golden State. At their perfect 24-0. San Antonio, who I said uh, in most years would be having a tremendous season. They've won eight out of their last ten. They're winning by an average of almost 12 points a game. Uh, But they're five games behind Golden State at this point. Oklahoma City is third. The L.A. Clippers are fourth. Followed by Dallas, Memphis, Houston, and Utah. Now, it's vice versa this year. Usually there are teams in the West that have a winning record that don't get in. And that's not the case this year because Houston and Utah, the 7th and 8th teams, are both one game under 500. Aha! Now, let's go to college basketball. And let's get the top 25 for you. Uh, Let me scroll down here. The rankings. 
the top 25 in college basketball. Uh, number one is a change from last week. Michigan State is at the top. Kansas is number two. North Carolina is number three. Iowa State, four. Kentucky, who lost, is in at number five. Maryland, who had previously been number two and lost, is down to six. Oklahoma, seven. Duke, eight. Villanova, nine. Virginia, ten. Purdue, coming in at 11. Xavier at 12. Arizona, 13. West Virginia, 14. Providence, 15. Baylor, 16. Miami, Butler, SMU, and Gonzaga finish out the top 20. Vanderbilt, Louisville, Cincinnati, Oregon, and Utah make up the top 25. Um, Used to, in my life, uh, college basketball almost rated as high as Major League Baseball in my way of looking at things. Uh, Things just have never been the same since, for me, since uh, Bob Knight was fired at IU. Uh, And I still love college basketball. Uh, I just don't watch watch it with an obsession like I did when I was young Um, and again it's a sport where uh, now with conference tournaments and uh, being 60 what is it 68 teams that get in um, until it gets conference time you know it's hard to, it's hard for me to get as excited about college basketball as what I once did until at least conference time. And with that, we will swing around and go to uh, the NFL. And one of the big stories that is out right now is the watch for the Heisman Trophy. And... I think they're down to three is what they're looking at. A quarterback, or two quarterbacks and a running back. Um, Christian McCaffrey, who is from Stanford uh, in the Pac-10 title game against USC, He had 461 all-purpose yards, but also cut a touchdown pass, rushed for a touchdown, and threw for a touchdown. That's uh, some versatility. Uh, uh, Let's see... If one is just looking at McCaffrey's stats, his lack of touchdown production might be a red flag. While McCaffrey had tons of yards between the goal lines, he was he often was replaced for bigger goal line backs, which hurt his scoring totals. And uh, my bad if I said that he he was a quarterback because he is not a quarterback; he is a running back. Um, he also broke Barry Sanders' season, season single season record for all-purpose yards with 3,250. No, that was what the record was. Man, I'm having a hard time understanding this article. The all-purpose record was 3,250 by Barry Sanders in 1988. McCaffrey had 3,496 this season. The second person in the Heisman watch is uh, Derrick Henry, a running back from Alabama. He had a great game against LSU and upstaged the LSU star, Leonard Fournette. And since that game, Henry's kept up appearances and received an increased workload while Alabama quarterback Jacob Coker has struggled. However, Henry might be a product of SEC lore. He rushed for 1,986 yards, which led the nation and both the Alabama and SEC record for yards. But he also had 20 more carries than McCaffrey, 
who was 139 rushing yards behind him. Henry averaged 5.9 yards per carry, which is really good, which was less than Fournette at 6.4, and Ohio Street, Street Ohio State's uh, Elliott, 6.4, and well behind Florida State's Dalvin Cook at 7.9. Henry's been a workhorse back, and he's the reason Alabama is in the college football playoff, but I'm not sure he's as good overall as some of his running back counterparts, is what the writer of this article says. Now we get to the one quarterback that is in the running, and that is Deshaun Watson. I guess I'm just so used to the Stanford quarterbacks being the the who you talk about is why I was uh, off my game a little bit there. Deshaun Watson from Clemson. Watson is the quarterback of the nation's top team, which contributed to his high Heisman standing. His numbers were good this year, especially his completion percentage, which hovered around 70%. What is most impressive about Watson was his ability to be used both as a rushing and passing threat. He really came on as a Heisman contender toward the end of the year, but did a lot of his damage against mediocre defenses. Among Clemson's final four opponents, Wake Forest had the best defense at number 40 in total defense, meaning that he was running up big numbers against inferior defenses. Otherwise, both Syracuse and South Carolina ranked in the 90s. That's even worse, obviously, than 40. But, I mean, that's that's getting way down there uh, in the numbers. Watson gained a lot of national momentum with his 289 yards passing and three touchdowns and 131 rushing yards and two scores in the AFC title game against North Carolina. But the Tar Heels was one of the worst the Tigers faced on defense at 100 nationally. So I'm sure that there are a lot of people going to say uh what would he do uh, against somebody that could play defense? And my my thinking is that either McCaffrey or Henry, one of the running backs, is going to be the Heisman Trophy winner. And if that's the case, it will be the first time in, I think I read the other day, six years that um, it was not a quarterback that was the Heisman Trophy winner. Um, let's look at the rankings for the top four uh, set for the playoffs. Clemson, Alabama, Michigan State, and Oklahoma. Uh, Michigan State jumped from five to three, which helps them, I, if you believe in the, the seeding part. That puts Oklahoma versus Clemson. Alabama and Michigan State in the first round games. And, well, there is um, there's excitement now that there is a football playoff. Um, in the past where they um, they didn't have a playoff and um, <laughs> uh, when they didn't have a playoff and it was done based on rankings alone, rankings would get the final two teams and those final two teams would play the one game. Uh, a lot of people felt left out. Of course, in a year like this, if you're Iowa, you feel left out because you only had one loss, several one-loss teams. And uh, I would be in favor of uh, another four or another 12 uh, teams making the playoffs. Uh, I would cut down on some of the uh, wimpy games that are played early in the year where Division One schools run up 
uh, the scores against either weak Division One schools or even sometimes Division Two schools. Um, Trevor sent me uh, <laughs> this is really cool. Thank you, Trevor. He sent me a link to nationalpastime.com and I need to bookmark this. There, that's done. So I can look at this again. Today in baseball history. We're trying to stretch this out for another few minutes and um, let's go back all the way to 1903. Now, this is the year my grandfather was born, and if he were still alive today, he would be 112. So this is a, a while ago. The Cardinals trade future Hall of Fame right-hander Mordecai Brown and catcher Jack O'Neill to the Cubs in exchange for catcher Larry McLean and Jack Taylor, a righty who will set the record for consecutive complete games in one season next year with... 39, 39 complete games. In baseball has changed so much. Uh, if you get five complete games in today's way of doing things, you're a workhorse. He did 39. Let's get to a little bit more modern history. Uh, in 1930, that's at least getting almost to the Depression, the Rules Committee decides a ball which bounces into the stands will no longer be ruled a home run, but will become a ground rule double, estimating that major leaguers who played in the era prior to the rule change hit about two homers a year that bounced over the wall. Babe Ruth's career total would have been reduced by about 22 round trippers. I did not know that. This, this is fun. In 1933, in names that you might recognize, the A's swap Lefty Grove, Rube Wahlberg, and Max Bishop to the Red Sox for Bob Klein, Rabbit Worstler, and $125,000, which was a lot of money. Let's, let's get into a little more. Let's at least get into the 60s. 1966, the U.S. Supreme Court, by a vote of 4-3, to three, refuses to review Wisconsin's suit to block the Braves' move to Atlanta. The team originally announced its intention to move to the Peach State for the 1965 season, but the injunction filed by the state of Wisconsin forced the club to stay put in Milwaukee for one final year. So they went from the Milwaukee Braves to the Atlanta Braves. Now we're going to get into, uh-oh, I am getting ready to sneeze. Let me see if I can mute myself. And, of course, I didn't sneeze. Uh, it'll probably hit me all of a sudden and you'll have to listen to it. 1975, the Tigers trade pitcher Mickey Lolich and outfielder Billy Baldwin to the Mets in exchange for outfielder Rusty Staub and pitcher Bill Laxton. Starting to get into some names that I recognize even more than just people like Lefty Grove and you recognize them because they were such great players in history. Uh... Um, in 1979, re-entry free agent second baseman Rennie Stennett, catcher Milt May, and outfielder Jim Wolford signed with the Giants. The combined total of the contract is nearly $5 million. 79, three well-known players signed for $5 million. We were talking earlier about Jason Haywood signing an eight-year contact tract worth nearly $200 million. Uh, 1998, after being given his last rights, Hall of Fame outfielder Joe DiMaggio appears to make a miraculous recovery, defying the doctor's dire predictions. 
in mid-January, the Yankee Clippers allowed to go home after a 99-day hospital stay, but will die at his home in Florida on March the 8th after a long battle with lung cancer. 1998. Signing a seven-year deal with the Dodgers, Kevin Brown became the baseball's first $100 million man with an average of $15 million per season, I remember. Uh, in a six-player deal, the Orioles traded former American League MVP Miguel Dejada to the Astros in exchange for pitchers Matt Albers, Troy Paxson, and Dennis Serfot, outfielder Luke Scott, and third baseman Michael Costanzo. Um, that is a, a trade where one huge name for a bunch of nobodies because, I mean, this was just in 2007 and I don't recognize any of the players going the other way. Also in 2007, free agent Aaron Rowland and the Giants agreed to a $60 million five-year deal. Paul LaDuca and the Nationals agreed to a $5 million one-year deal which puts the former Mets catcher behind home plate for Washington. Uh, 2008, the Yankees signed their second ace this week as the club reaches an agreement with free agent A.J. Burnett. The Bronx Bombers inked the former Blue Jays right-hander to an $82.5 million five-year deal after signing C.C. Sabathia to a $161 million deal over seven years. Uh... 2008, reeling from its second consecutive season-ending collapse, the Mets continue to overhaul their much-maligned bullpen. Let's go to the last one. 2013, Mariners land the most sought-after free agent when the team signs Robinson Cano to a 10-year, $240 million contract, a value that equals Pujols' deal with the Angels for the third largest in baseball history. And that would be good riddance Albert Pujols deal. Uh, which, by the way, he was my favorite player ever. No, not ever. Lou Brock was my favorite player ever. But of modern-day Cardinals, Albert Pujols was my favorite until he couldn't take $200 million uh, and then turn around and said it wasn't about the money. <laughs> And so we are going to uh, play a song, and then I hope to have my guest back here with me as we get started. This is Sports Talk with Ed Boston.
All right, well, we are ready to kick off our wrestling segment. Let me unmute my good friend Vanessa. Vanessa, are you there? I sure am, and how are you? I'm good. Tell me about that song we just listened to. Actually, I actually wasn't able to hear the song because I literally just called it because my roommate just left, and I was like, all right, I have peace and quiet, and I am home all alone. So I actually just called in, so I missed the song. I am sorry. Well, it was the NXT theme song for this upcoming show. Oh, nice. So it was, well, it depends on which one you listen to because there is two theme songs. So it was either the one by Motorhead, the Ace of Spades, or it was the one by The Strut. I don't even remember what it's called. It was. I was actually listening to that song this morning if it was one of those two. It was Ace of Spades. Nice. There, there's some significance behind that, I believe, isn't there? Yeah, um, well, you know, Triple H, he's always been buddies with the lead singer of Motorhead, and, you know, he, on the conference call, I think it was a few days ago, it might have even been just yesterday, he was talking about how that type of music relates to NXT because it, it's just like a, a different breed, in a sense, and uh, he just talked about, like, how, you know, music and wrestling, they go hand in hand as far as the type of fan goes. And, you know, wrestling, um, being a wrestler, your job is to connect with the crowd. And essentially, it's the same thing you do as a musician. So, Triple H, he pretty much went on record and said, you know, it's been an honor for him to, like, dive into new music and, and find things that fit for the, you know, specific takeovers. And then he actually called the guy from Motorhead and was like, hey, can I borrow this song? And he was like, of course, and he gave him permission. So we have that. I, I think it's pretty awesome because as far as myself, like that is the kind of music that I listen to as well, and I am a wrestling fan. So it was like, yeah, Triple H, I totally agree with you on that one. Well, let's do this. Uh, we're going to look at th- kind of three different sections in the wrestling part today. We're going to look at MMA. And yes. I know I know we got some Ronda Rousey information for this week. And we're going to yes. look at the WWE pay-per-view that's coming up. And we'll do that at the very end. And then yes. in between, we're going to bunch in um, NXT and, and other things. And I wanted to do NXT before we did WWE because I think everybody is a little more excited about TakeOver in London which is on Wednesday, than they are about tables, ladders, and chairs tomorrow night for the WWE. What do you think? Yeah, I would absolutely agree. I don't know. It's just something about the way, you know, Triple H handles NXT. And, and you know, he said in the press conference uh, earlier that I listened to, he said that it's like comparing chocolate and vanilla. It's, it's two different things. And, you know, he has creative control in it. In in sorry, I'm getting tongue twisted because I'm getting so excited. He has creative control in NXT, but he doesn't have creative control, you know, on the main roster, obviously, Vince and his cronies do over there. And, I mean, seriously, guys, this is not just me, like, blowing smoke up everybody's butt. But if you are not familiar with wrestling, but you should be because you're listening to this portion of the podcast, if you're not and if you go and watch, the main roster, you know, Monday Night Raw and Thursday Night SmackDown, and then you go watch NXT, it's completely different. And you have three hours on Monday and Thursday, oh, three hours on Monday, two hours on Thursday, and then you get one hour on Wednesday on NXT. But that one hour of NXT is far better than any three-hour thing that Raw can put together or any two-hour thing that SmackDown can put together. If you're a wrestling fan and if you stray away from the WWE, I, I've done it before in my life, and if, if you're listening to this and if you've done that, and if you're looking to watch something that's somewhat WWE related, go watch NXT. I always say all the time, the nine ninety nine that I pay a month, I would legitimately pay nine ninety nine just for NXT. That's how good it is. Every Wednesday, they step up the game. Every Takeover, they step up their game. So I agree 100% that people are far more excited for NXT Takeover in London than they are tables, letters, and chairs. Well, th- there's excitement 
as well about Ronda Rousey. And we, I remember the last time we talked, uh, I asked you, you what you thought, and I think it's going to turn out to be almost exactly what you predicted. Uh, yeah. r- tell us about Ronda's next fight and how long she's going to be off and those kind of things. Yeah, um, well, actually, she just got interviewed by uh, ESPN. I mean, a lot of Ronda stuff has happened since the last time we talked, so I'm going to, like, dabble in everything. She was interviewed by ESPN. Uh, she admitted to being really sad over the loss and embarrassed, and she felt that um, her performance that night was a poor representation of herself, and she said that she has to come back, that she has to beat this chick because she's not done fighting because... What else am I going to explicit do? She, you know, dropped an F bomb in there, and um, you know, she she also said that if she loses to Holly Holm, she might consider retirement. So there was a little bit of negativity in there. Um, but then just recently, I think it was yesterday, might have been two days ago, she was stopped by TMZ. She was leaving around 4 a.m. Uh, to go to the airport, and they asked her, like, where are you going at this time of night? And she said that she was going to the Marine Corps Ball, if anybody remembers uh, that viral video where, uh, I think his name is Jared Hatcher, uh, invited her to the Marine Corps Ball, and she accepted, and, you know, she kept her word, and she went, and, you know, to me, that says a lot about Ronda Rousey, because obviously she's in a you know, a sad state, she's depressed, she's admitted it, she's not happy, you know, she's dealing with a lot, and for her to keep her word and to go and, and do that is amazing, and that's one of the many reasons why I love her, um, and as far as fighting news goes, uh, Dana White, he went on the Mike and Mike ESPN radio show, and he essentially said that, uh, UFC 200 will be Holly Holm versus Ronda Rousey number two. At least that's what's paid. I mean, things can change, but, um, you know, the fight isn't officially as still yet, but that's the idea, and that's where they want to go. Um, and it, that's uh, six, seven months away from now. It'll be in July, and it'll be during the International Fight Week, and it'll be in the new arena that they um, have in Vegas. So it's going to be a huge deal. Um, in the same interview with TMZ, they asked Ronda how she felt about that fight, and she said it's what she wants, but it just depends on the UFC and Holly Holmes fight cap, so we'll see. And, um, I mean, I honestly, as a fan, I, I feel mixed emotions about it, even though last time we talked, um, I had said that's what, what's going to happen. I knew that's what was going to happen, but I still feel mixed emotions just because I feel like six or seven months still might be too soon for Ronda Rousey just because I know she has a bunch of like movie, you know, projects coming up and things and, you know, she even said in the ESPN interview that she probably won't even be able to get an apple for six months so then it's like if that's the case then why are you fighting in six, seven months? But I don't know. I, I believe in her. I, I believe that she can get her belt back but, I mean, I'm excited but at the same time I'm like maybe it's too soon maybe at least wait a year That's the thing with with sports in general. Uh, it's all about the money. And, you know, I was talking earlier uh, on Sports Talk about uh, a guy who basically isn't even an all-star caliber player getting a contract worth $200 million. And <laughs> it just boggles my mind. But you're right. If if Hollywood to fight between now and, and Rousey and lost, it wouldn't. There would be no luster to to that. Exactly. Uh, yep. You know, it'd be like it'd be like a peanut butter sandwich without the jelly. You know, peanut butter and exactly. jelly sandwich without the jelly, or whatever you want to look at it. Um, and so, for the good of the sport, you know, she's going to have to stay. 
uh, inactive. Enjoy the time as being a champion. And, um, you know, just train like she's never trained before because I got to believe that Rhonda's going to come out and, and, and have some answers for some of the things that she does that she didn't have the last match. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of those deals where even I'm excited and I'm not an MMA f- follower so much. I'm, I'm a Ronda Rousey follower. Uh, and speaking of that, daggone, Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. Goodness yeah. gracious. Holy cow. Ronda Rousey, man, she she has it all. Like, I, I bet you people are going to be listening to this and they'll be like, great, more Ronda Rousey talk. But the size of the matter is she has a total package. She's beautiful. She knows how to sell fights, whether you like her antics or not. I've said that before. I'll say it again. She's a humanitarian. Yes, I said it. I know a lot of people don't like her attitude, but she has done tremendous charity work. And not only that, but she is a great fighter and I'm with you. I, I gotta believe that she's gonna come back, and she's gonna come back with a vengeance, and she's gonna be vicious, and she's gonna want that title back. And uh, I think she's gonna get it back. And I, I'm excited. And, and like you said, uh, to your point earlier, I just want to point out how you said that uh, if Holly was to lose, it, it would, you know, not be as exciting. Say, for example, Holly Holm fights Misha Tate, then by some crazy miracle, Misha Tate beats Holly Holm. That would mean that Holly Holm, I mean, not Holly Holm, that would mean that Misha Tate would have to fight Ronda Rousey for the title once Ronda Rousey was ready. And that is a fight that we have seen two times already, and in both occasions, Ronda Rousey beat her. So it's like, does anybody really want to see that fight? I mean, that's why Holly Holm got the title fight in the first place, because originally it was supposed to be Misha, and Dana was like, nobody wants to see that fight for a third time. So, I mean... There's, there's a lot of arguments of, like, how Ronda should have tune-up fights before she goes and fights Holly again. But then it's like, you know, she's already beat almost everybody in the top ten already. So it's like the most logical thing for them to do, whether you like it or not, is Holly Holm versus Ronda Rousey at UFC 200 or maybe later, but who knows. But it's going to happen, guys. We gotta, you got to accept the fact. Man, it's going to happen, and I know some people don't like it. I know some people hate it. I love it. I know that you love it. I know that Trevor loves it. So it's like, you know, you can't win them all, but, you know, can't please everyone. Well, here's the deal. <laughs> Whether people like it or don't like it, if if she had a warm-up fight and somehow, you know, ripped her knee up or something and w- was out of MMA forever... You know, what a waste. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be that uh, that lingering question of what if, like, if I ever got to fight Hulk home again, would I be able to beat her? And then we might not ever get to see that. Exactly. See, so you're thinking realistically and logically. I like that. Other what? people need to start thinking that way, too. Well, and uh, that gets me in trouble sometimes. I try, I try to be a realistic and logical person. And I know sometimes yeah. in the world of sports that that doesn't make any sense. Like it, like paying two hundred million dollars to a guy that's not even on the All Star team. <laughs> that, that's crazy. <laughs> I, ha- I actually had a rant on the sports show. I don't know if I've had a rant yet before tonight on the sports show. Um, but you're right. It, it, it Dana White it, it didn't build UFC to what it is by being stupid and. Yeah. So he knows what he's talking about. Now, I'm going to get in a couple news items here before we get to NXT. And it's kind of interesting that, to me, the biggest thing that we really need to talk about in in WWE news-wise is Sting needing neck surgery and Daniel Bryan saying his WWE career might be over. Uh, that, yeah, I heard both of those Go ahead. Talk about Daniel Bryan first. Um, yeah. I think when I read it, he essentially said that um, his WWE career is over, but not necessarily his wrestling career. So that had everyone up in arms and was like, whoa, what does that mean? Like, is the indie darling going to go back to ROH? You know, is he going to go to PWG? What, what's going to happen? Um, you know, they, they, they even threw out, like, 
global force wrestling out there. They were like, would he go there? Would he go to TNA? I mean, we, we've heard it before. You know, Daniel Bryan is a wrestler. He's not, I mean, he entertains people, yes, he does. But at the end of the day, he's a wrestler and he loves wrestling. And, you know, I I don't know how his health is. And I've heard, like, numerous reports of, like, that he's cleared, that he isn't cleared, that he's been cleared, but WWE doesn't want to risk putting him back in the ring, you know, to get injured again because he's injury prone. And it's like, if WWE's not going to give him that chance, and if he still wants to wrestle, then I support him 100% going out there. You know, the WWE, it is the top of the top, but it isn't the end all be all of professional wrestling, and everybody should know that. Um, so, I mean, I don't know, it's an interesting thing to think about, like seeing Daniel Bryan somewhere else other than WWE, but, I mean, if that's what he chooses to do, um, I support him 100%, and even if he chooses to hang up the boots and, and not wrestle anymore, I also support that, you know, Bree and him have talked about it for a while, Bree has had baby fever for a while, so, I mean, if they want to both hang up their boots respectively and have, you know, family, then... Then I respect that, because at the end of the day, yeah, they're there for our entertainment, but they're human beings, too. Well, I find it interesting that he's been cleared by a very reputable doctor who has worked the Super Bowl for the NFL. But yes. But the NF, that isn't good enough. The WWE won't clear him. And I know that the WWE has a, a lot of mud on their face about... Uh, concussions, uh, the health of older wrestlers and how they weren't taken care of. Uh, anytime that there's any the slightest little um, tweak in the ring, you know, things are stopped now and the, the doctors come in with gloves and checking on things. And actually, sometimes you don't know if that's a work or if it's real. But Yeah, sometimes you can't even tell anymore. You're absolutely right. But... Uh, it's obviously got to be a, a liability issue with them because, I mean, Daniel Bryan hasn't been on TV in so long and there yeah. is not a Raw that goes by that you don't hear a yes chant. Exactly, yep. Absolutely right, 100%. They can, like, they yes for things that are not even Daniel Bryan related. Like, now that chant is used for things that are awesome that the crowd loves, you know? Like, yeah. It's not even necessarily in response to Daniel Bryan, but it's like, that's what he created. That's how much people love him. And now that yes chant is like, it's a cultural thing now at wrestling shows. It, it's like ECW and This Is Awesome, you know? Uh, it, you know, things that are usually you get This Is Awesome for, we're now getting the yes chant to. Yep. And... In the article that is posted up on WrestlingNewsBlog.com, that's where we get all of our wrestling news, um, Brian said he had a discussion with John Cena about what was going on. And and if something were to happen to him in the WWE, would he go back to doing the indies? And Brian's response was, absolutely. And I can just picture that. Yep, I can too, you know, like like I said earlier, he's an indie darling, I know that turn has turned around a lot, but it is, what, it is what it is, and he is that, you know, that fits him uh, perfectly, because it's like he went in there, he didn't have the look, he didn't have the physique, but he was a damn good wrestler, you know what I mean, it's like, he was able to captivate you through his wrestling, and that's why people love him, and he was, he was the underdog, and he's, he's amazing, like, he's one of my favorites, and it sucks because I am a WWE kid. I have been. Everyone that knows me and that has listened to me babble before knows that I'm a WWE mark. Right? But it's like, if I have to venture out to watch Daniel Bryan, I'm going to do it because he's one of my favorite wrestlers and he's one of the best performers that we have. And I think it's it's a shame that WWE won't let him get back in the ring. I mean, I understand where they're coming from, but it's like, man, dude, you're dropping a ball with this guy because can you just imagine if he, like, goes back to ROH or if he, you know, he goes to Global Force Wrestling. Can you just imagine, like, Vince and everyone's going to be like, they might say that they don't care because of his looks or whatever, and then they put that into the storyline, you know, real life, and they put it in there. They might say that they don't care, but at the end of the day, they're going to be kicking themselves in the butt because they're like, we let this one go because we were too afraid. 
And so if he goes back to the Indies, like, I'm with you. I just totally see it happening. Well, and again, it's about money. And, and in Vince McMahon's case, McMahon's case, many times it's about ego as well. And yeah. uh, you get Daniel Bryan going to either one of those two you mentioned, Ring of Honor or GFW, and it's going to make money for either one of those places. And, and when somebody else is making money, that gets to Vince's ego. And, you know, I, personally, I would love to see Daniel Bryan in Global Force Wrestling. I mean, you know, I'm it would a big. That'd be amazing, wouldn't it? Yeah. And, um,. It would just – just think about if they were to be on tour in the Northwest, you know, close to the Washington State, and they brought in Daniel Bryan, even if it was just for a night. I mean, the arena would be so packed that there wouldn't be – It would be, go bonkers. Yeah, it would, there wouldn't even be breathing room in the arena, and, and the – the man, I mean, I'm just thinking – I got cold chills just now, thinking, thinking about, about Daniel it. Bryan coming. It, they are, and even if he would, I could even picture him going back to to little tiny places, you know, where his roots really came from, uh, and, and and helping out young wrestlers and saying, "Look, yep. you know, look at me. I'm no, I'm no Andre the Giant. I'm no Hulk Hogan. I'm no uh, Lex Luger." Uh, you know, I don't have these muscles that are bulging from every, you know, angle of my body. I'm not six foot seven, uh, you know, but I was world heavyweight champion and I had thousands and thousands of thousands of people basically right under his, whatever he would do there for a little while. And even right now, if he were to come back, you know, whatever he was to do, the fans would just follow, just like that. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's because he has that, like like I said, he's not, like, let's be honest here. I, I've met the guy, too. He's, like, super shy and, like, super introverted and keeps to himself. He doesn't have, like, that charisma that's like, oh, man, like, I want to, like, hang out with that guy. You know what I mean? But, I mean, he doesn't have the look either with the scruffy beard, and I'm not just saying that, but I promise, because I love the guy. But... What it is about him is he's a wrestling fan wrestler. Because for anybody that's been watching watching wrestling for years, like you and I have, it's like we watch it for the wrestling, not all this entertainment mumbo jumbo stuff that they draw us every now and then. I mean, every now and then it's okay, but sometimes lately with WWE, it's like, okay, why are you doing this? This is so stupid. Nobody wants to watch. Um, you know, we watch the wrestling, and that's what Daniel Bryan does. He's a wrestler, and like I said, he's good at it, and that's why people love him. That's why crowds are drawn to him. And if Vince could figure it out that people actually care more about wrestling than some stupid skit that nobody like would even want to watch, you know, WWE would be in a much better state. And I'm going to say it right now. Vince needs to take a freaking few notes from Triple H because if he did it would be so much better and I, if that was the case Dan O'Brien would be on TV right now but they're well, being stubborn and if they lose him they lose him I uh, I meant to say this earlier and, and um, it just slipped my mind after we got to talking about something else uh, I'm not sure that Triple H calling WWE Vanilla is good for his inheritance. No, it's definitely not. Because uh, it was funny, because I remember when we were having the conversation earlier, I was like, so wait, NXT is the chocolate, and, and you know, the main roster is vanilla, right? And she was like, well, you know, vanilla is obviously often perceived as boring. And I was like, okay, I, I thought so. I thought that's what we were going, but I wanted to make sure. Um, and yeah, I mean, can you imagine, like, Vince listening to that conference call? He was probably feeling at the ears, like, you just called my tires boring, how dare you? And he was like, no, you're going to be cut off the wax. No, not really, but, I mean, maybe, but, you know, I mean, it, it's true, though, guys. Like, I'm telling you, if you've never watched NXT in your life, and I say this almost in every freaking broadcast we do together, if you're out there listening to this, and if you have never watched 
NXT in your life. Do it this Wednesday. You won't regret it. I mean, seriously, there's never a dull moment with NXT. There's never a moment where you're like, oh, God, that match was so stupid, or, oh, God, that segment was so stupid. Like, you never, ever will say that watching NXT. And, and you won't get tired watching it. You won't even want to use the restroom, ever. Like, you know how we always joke about, oh, bathroom break on the main roster. There's no time for bathroom breaks on NXT, so that means you have to hold it for a whole hour. For some people, that gets stuck. So, <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, guys. And if you're if you're a die ho- if you're a diehard NXT fan, you can catheter yourself to make it through that whole hour. Because you would have to do it, yeah. Because let, let's be honest, I know some people they they have weak bladders. An hour is a horrible time to hold it, but I mean, seriously, like I said, there's no time for bathroom breaks on NXT. So you don't want to use the restroom ever. Like you know, it's just it's just so bad. Like NXT is crushing. Anything on the main roster. Well, I'm like, and it's sad. Be- it's sad because, like, I don't know, people come from NXT to go on the main roster, and sometimes they're like, "Do I really want them on the main roster?" No, 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 no. I don't want them there. You know, like, stay in NXT forever, please. Well, and like I said, it's a shame that the only thing that I can find that I really want to talk about on WWE is Daniel Bryan and Sting, and neither one of them are in the ring right now. Yeah, exactly. It's like. They're not even active, but we, the only thing that's important that, you know, shows us need to be talked about is because they're injured, and that's a shame, because there, there's nothing happening in WWE right now that's like, ooh, I want to know what's going to happen there, like, oh, I'm so excited, it's like, no, you don't get that feeling, like, I've said it before, I just started watching Raw again, because I just uh, got, a, like, a space to myself, where I have my own TV and everything, so I went, like, almost a year without watching Raw on a Monday. Like, I would have to watch it, like, on a Tuesday, or sometimes I wouldn't even watch it at all, or sometimes I would only watch the matches I wanted to watch. And it's like, I just started watching it again, and even now, I'm like, oh, like, why, why did I start again? Like, why am I watching this? Like, you know, there was many times on Mondays recently where I was watching The Voice instead of Raw. It's, well, I, I mean, it sounds bad, because I'm a wrestling fan, but I mean, there's, there's nothing happening. And I find myself... Uh, I'll admit the same kind of thing. We would watch Dancing with the Stars, D- yeah. DVR Raw. I would watch it the next day, and I was glad I DVR'd it. And, and that's not just because I could skip through the commercials, but it was because I could skip through some of the stupid matches and stupid segments yeah. that they had. Absolutely. And it's funny because I, I remember a time, and it was the only time my mom was still alive. This was like four years ago, probably even more because. Uh, you know, it was it, even four years ago, WWE started kind of, you know, spiraling down. But I remember there was, like, a time in my life where me and my mom would be out somewhere, going out to dinner and going out to the grocery store. And I'd be like, Mom, what time is it? She's like, it's almost 5 o'clock. Or, like, it's almost, you know, it's kind of like 6 o'clock. It's almost 6 o'clock. I'm like, Mom, we need to get home for all. I can't miss the beginning. She's like, no, you can miss the beginning. I'm like, no, no, Mom. I no. can't miss the beginning. Yeah. She's like, it was like you missed um, a national event if you missed the first 15 minutes of Raw. Yep. That's exactly what it was like. I was like, you don't understand. Like, the beginning of Raw sets up a whole entire show. And, like, sometimes in the beginning, like, you have those, like, surprise returns or, like, those oh my God moments. Like, no way, that shit just happened. But now it's like, hey, the first hour kind of sucks. The second hour sucks. The third hour is kind of okay, like, you know, I mean, it's, it's sad, it makes me sad as a long-time WWE fan, but honestly, that's why I'm grateful for NXT, because if it wasn't for NXT, I'd probably just be like, WWE, what now, bye, like, you know? Well, let me, let me go through uh, a few news stories here real quick, uh, just highlight them, uh, and then as soon as I get done with that, I want you to give us the card for NXT. Uh, take over in London, and then we'll talk about that for a while. Of course, Sting does need surgery. Uh, I'm surprised that it, we're just now finding out. I, I mean, I would have guessed he needed surgery uh, as soon as he got hurt. Um, yeah. That neck injury, uh, much like John Cena had at a similar at a time in his career, and Cena's was fixed. Uh, 
he's going to see Dr. Maroon, who has done several of the WWE guys uh, with great success. So, you know, just as a, an editorial comment, as much as I love Sting in the ring, um, I wish he'd hang him up. I, I hate to see him go yeah. out go out hurt. And uh, but we'll, we'll see. Uh, Lucha Underground season two is set, uh, and they're close to signing Ray Mysterio Jr. And see, uh, you know that that's a former WWE champion, and it fits right along the line of Daniel Bryan. You look at Ray Mysterio Jr. and you look at uh, the big black sheep of the of the Wyatt family. And you think, well, there would be no chance in hell that Rey Mysterio Jr. could beat somebody that size. And here he was. He was he was WWE champion. Uh, I mean, people like Eddie Guerrero. And, and then, of course, you got people like Kevin Nash that make their stupid comments that people the size of Eddie Guerrero should have never been champion. And, yeah, and, and, I'll never forget that. That upset me so bad. Yeah, I, as a matter of fact, we even... Uh, sent some condolences to um, Vicky Guerrero, uh, Trevor and I did during that period of time. Uh, but Ray is looking like he is going to sign with Lucha Underground. That's amazing. Uh, GFW, Global Force Wrestling, uh, announced its first live events for 2016. They're going to be in the Northeast for the first time to open the new year. Uh in January, they're going to be in New York, uh, then New Jersey, and um, one of the things that uh, recently happened uh, involving GFW owner uh, Jeff Jarrett, he was in a match with uh, Matt Hardy. Oh, yeah. And did a guitar shot on Hardy that that miserably failed, and uh, Hardy ended up, I think, with thirty nine stitches. Yep, I saw that article up on WNB. It was a lot of blood, a lot of a lot of blood. I was like, this is gross, but. I'm thinking Matt Hardy loved every second of it. Is what I'm thinking. Yep. I have to agree 100 percent just because uh, you know from his his early days with his brother you know Team Extreme all about Extreme he was a former ECW champion so yeah no, I'm I'm right there with you I'm pretty sure he loved every single moment and and kudos to him for for continuing too because that was a lot of fun I was like how do you even see through all of that like I don't how how does that even work I don't I don't get it but well, it was amazing it, if yeah, he, I, I give him props. If he would have had red hair, I mean, legitimately had red hair, you could have not told the difference between blood and his hair. Yeah, because so it, was, blood it was it was everywhere, all over, all down his face and chest, and it, yeah, and thirty nine stitches—that's a lot of stitches for uh, your head. We've been beating around the bush, and we've been talking about how great NXT is. Let's talk hey, about. Thank you for doing this. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to cut you off real quick. Hey, you're probably going to. Hey, our listeners are going to hate me. Well, they might not hate me, but they're going to hate me. But before we go any further, I just want to say that I'm sorry for cutting you off. I feel like, as an anime fan, if I don't mention this tonight, People are going to be upset at me. So I well, we, like I we don't want you to come on here and get anybody upset at you. So you do what you got to do. Okay. Well, tonight is UFC 194. And 
it is probably the most anticipated fight of like all MMA history. Okay, maybe not all MMA history, but in a long time because tonight we're going to see Jose Aldo Jr. versus Conor McGregor for I think it's, I, I want to say it's the featherweight title. It's exactly what it is. Um, and uh, you know that's that's what's going on tonight. And it's happening, and everybody is, like, so excited about the fight, including myself. Unfortunately, I won't be watching it because I didn't have money for pay-per-view. But, I mean, they were supposed to fight last year, and then, you know, Jose, he got injured, and he, and he couldn't uh, compete. So then they had a interim title fight between Chad Mendes and Conor McGregor, and then Conor McGregor became the interim title champion. And then a lot of people believed, oh, Conor's not the real champion, Jose Aldo is. So tonight, finally, the cage door opens. They're going to fight. It's going to be a war. And at the end of the night, we will have a real featherweight champion, whether it's Aldo or McGregor. Who knows? I'm rooting for McGregor. I'll go on record and say it. So we'll see what happens. That's the main event. And also in the co-main event tonight, Chris Weidman will be defending his middleweight title against Luke Rockhold. And that's also an anticipated matchup. So we got those two big fights tonight. And... I'm going for Chris Weidman on that one, so we'll see what happens. But yeah, UFC 194 is happening to him pay per view, uh, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 10 p.m. Eastern. So you still have time to order it if you want to. I just had to get that out there because I felt like people were going to be like, "Really, you discussed him already? But you didn't discuss the biggest fight of like the year yet?" So I, I had to do that. And you, if you can get the entire card over at WrestlingNewsBlog.com, it's up uh, at the very top, I believe. Well, no, it's down a little ways, but uh, there is an MMA article at the top, and then scroll down, I think, two more articles, and you got the complete UFC 194 card there for you to look at. Uh, let's just, before we get to the uh, the lineup for the... I want to call it the pay-per-view because that's really what uh, TakeOver is for yeah, them. Um, let, let's talk about something that you mentioned earlier about get, the wrestlers who get the call-ups. And, um, you know, I can think of name after name after name that got called up and maybe got a push for a couple, three weeks and then got buried. Uh and apparently even uh, Triple H said on the uh, call that F- Finn Balor doesn't want to go up to the main roster. Yeah, no. Yeah, he absolutely he did say that, and it's insane. And um, I, I applaud him for that. I mean, I know it sounds silly, but it's like, you, come on. Like, that should be your, like, ultimate dream to aspire and be on Raw. But it's like, that's how bad Raw is right now. That's how bad the main roster is right now. And, Finn Balor, he's phenomenal, you know, and, um, you know, to Triple H's point in the, you know, the show, he was talking about how Finn just wants to stay and uh, be in NXT for a while and, and soak up as much knowledge as he can and connect with that crowd as much as he can and do what he can there before he steps forward on the main roster. And, you know, um, they were, so I forgot who pointed it out, but in the conference call, someone asked Triple H, you know, like, what happens when... Uh, you know, your big guys, like, you know, like your Daniel Bryan and your Don Cena and your Randy Orton, what happens when they get injured? Um, does that, you know, create, like, a, a, you know, a rush to call somebody up, like Finn Balor? And Triple H said that, you know, it could happen, but he wouldn't do it that way just because he feels that someone like Finn Balor's caliber shouldn't be a guy that's like, oh, we're just going to put you on the show to be the band-aid that holds us together. Well, you know, well, you can because it's like, what happens when the big guy is like Randy Orton and John Cena come back? So then what do we do with Finn Balor? You know, he said that guys like that shouldn't be called up into the roster, the main roster, until they know absolutely where they would go with them because he doesn't want them to go and then be like, oh, well, we don't know what we're going to do with you now. So, hey, let's just sit you on the shelf. I mean, we've seen it numerous times. We've seen it with Adam Rose. We've seen it with the Witcher Dragons. We've seen it with the Ascension. We've seen it even with Paige, you know, her storylines are repetitive. We're even seeing it now with Becky Lynch and Sasha Banks. Every week, there is we want Sasha Chance. And, okay, you know, sometimes we get her and sometimes just squash matches and sometimes the 
the matches don't even that great. They're like three minutes, five minutes long. And we're like, this is a girl that was in a 30-minute Ironman match, and you're putting her on TV for five minutes? Like, give me a break. <laughs> like, it's, it's sad the way that the NXT folk are being treated out in the main roster. They deserve far more. And, you know, to Triple H's point also, he said, you know, when you get called to the main roster, it's a different, uh, like, atmosphere that NXT has. And sometimes the people that are getting called from NXT, they're afraid to essentially, I guess, be themselves, and they kind of lose their groove, and it takes them a while to get back into that groove. And I don't know, I just think the main roster is like a curse. I mean, it sounds bad, but that's how I feel. Like, I have a lot of people that I love down in NXT daily being one of them. And I know the time when the main roster is going to come soon, but, uh, that's something that legitimately scares me because I'm like, is the gimmick going to translate well in the main roster? You know, and I'm like, I don't want Bailey to be a, a botch, not a botch wrestler, but, you, you know, one of those wrestlers that, like, loses in, like, two seconds or whatever, you know? Like, I don't want her to be that. And I'm just like, uh, can we not, like, can you not go to the main roster, please? Just stay at the XP. I, I will travel to Florida to see you if I have to because I don't want you on the main roster. And it sounds bad to say, but but it's the truth. Well, I think about the Ascension. The, they they were brought up, given the stupidest gimmick in, in, yeah. imaginable, trying to trying to imitate the Road Warriors. Now, yeah. if you're old school, nobody can imitate the Road Warriors. No, Absolutely. nobody can imitate them, and, and to make them have to try to do that. And then, of course, they're going to fail miserably at that because it can't be done. And then they're just jobbers now. I mean, that's all they are. That's you know, the, the word I was looking for, jobbers. I don't want Bailey to be a jobber. That would kill me. Literally kill me. I would die. Well, and, I mean, they, they're they using them as props for stardust. I mean, yeah. please. Yep. Absolutely. And, and the thing yeah. is, is... If I understand right, the Ascension were over big time in NXT. Absolutely. No, I was just about to say that. You took the word right out of my mouth. They held the tag team titles for the longest. They had the longest reign. I think it was almost a year, or it might have even been a year. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't remember the exact number, but they dominated, dominated the the tag team division over there. And and people loved Connor and Victor. They loved them. People, like, just... And when they, they made a return to NXT, like, recently, I think it was, like, a few months ago, crowd went insane, but on the main roster, it's like, oh, they come out and it's tumbleweed, it's like, no, but they were huge on NXT, and now you see them and you're just like, oh. Same thing with Neville, he was huge on NXT, too, and I'm not saying he's completely, like, buried down on the main roster, because he isn't, but I mean, what are they doing with him? Nothing. Honestly, nothing. nothing. Exactly. To me, the only, like, this is, I mean this, the only people that are getting the proper treatment from the, in the main roster that, that were on NXT would probably be Kevin Owens, maybe Charlotte, and maybe Paige. And I say maybe with Paige and Charlotte just because, yeah, the contact signing they did a few weeks ago was amazing. Got people talking. But then, okay, they kind of let it go and it fizzled out. And now Charlotte's supposed to probably be a hill. And I'm like, well, where are you going with this? I don't understand. Like, is Paige the face now after she said those, like, disheartening comments? I don't get it. I don't know what they're doing. So even with them, it's kind of, it's kind of disgraceful. And I'm just like, honestly, Kevin Owens is probably the only one that's that's getting the proper treatment, and I'm just like, oh, please don't let them ruin that, because people love him, and I, I just don't want to see him go down that road either, but I don't know. The main roster does not know what to do with their talent, and that's the, that's the truth. And we know that Triple H, or Paul, as we call him behind the scenes, uh, obviously does know what to do with his talent. Give us the lineup yeah. for Wednesday oh, night. Man, I, I'm so excited about like every time a takeover happens, I'm like, uh, I'm so hyped. It's funny because it's happening at 12 p.m. my time, and I, I'll admit, I'll say on air, I'm not embarrassed. That's the time that I usually wake up because I, I sleep. I, I go to sleep super late just because creative people are always.
always up late. Apparently, I don't know why, but that's just how it works. And so I'm like, I usually wake up at that time, so I don't even have to wake up extra early just to make sure that I don't miss an XP, that way I can get myself situated and get myself hyped. Because, guys, this is not a card you are going to want to miss. Hell, you wouldn't want to miss anything on NXT, but this London card, it, it's a really good card. We have uh, Apollo Crews versus Baron Corbin. Those two are, are like, hard-hitting, muscly guys, and they're big in size, and their feud has been boiling over in the past few weeks, so that's going to be amazing. Um, you know, Corbin's kind of like the guy who, you know, was a football player before, and he because of that, got made his way into WWE, so a lot of the fans don't uh, like him for that reason, and he gets blue a lot, and he's definitely the hill in this one, Apollo Crews, he's, he's the face, you know, he's super athletic for a guy his size, I mean, the back twist that he does, I'm like, whoa, how do you do that, how do you get that much air, because you're so fluffy, and I, I don't understand it, it's, it's something else, and it really is a thing of beauty, so that's going to be an amazing matchup, we have... The tag team title is being put on the line. Uh, it's going to be Colin Cassidy and Enzo Amore versus uh, Dash, Dash Wilder. And uh, I forgot the other guy's first name, but his last name is Dawson. And I know Trevor's probably going to kill me because I'm like, how did you forget? But anyway, the tag team title is on the line. Enzo Amore and Colin Cassidy are a fan favorite. Every time that they go out there, they have their little entrance, and everybody says the entrance word for word because people will them. And, you know, uh, Dash and Dawson, they, they pretty much uh, beat the crap out of Colin Cassidy and Enzo Amore a few weeks ago, and they've been injured, and now they're coming back for a vengeance to hopefully get the tag title. So that's happening. Then you have Oscar versus Emma, which is. We have two women's fights on the not fights, matches on the card, which is amazing to me because it's like, yep, see, in XP, I've been the women, that's what Paul loves to do. Um, Oscar, she's an international superstar, you know, came from Japan. She she has a little bit of everything, you know, like the, the mixed martial arts are even in her, you know, her promos have been very, uh, you know, it has that mixed martial arts feel, you know, she wrestled Dana Brooke in the last takeover and gave Dana Brooke a concussion. I, I'm saying concussion in air quotes because it obviously wasn't a real one. And uh, Dana Brooke, she had to forget everything that happened. Like, she couldn't remember getting beat by Oscar, so it was pretty funny. And then, you know, Emma wanted revenge, and Emma tried to attack Oscar from behind, and Oscar was too quick to, to fall for that. And now, finally, Oscar could fight wrestle Emma, I keep saying fighting, I don't know why, but, um, yeah, they're gonna wrestle each other, and it's gonna be a good one, and I'm excited, because I've always loved Emma, you know, Emma's another case of one of those, oh, I went to the main roster, they did all to do with me, so now she's back in NXT, and she's a whole different character, she's a hill, and she's, I'm like, it's amazing, and Oscar's amazing, so that's gonna be uh, another good, you know, match, and then we have, um, the NXT Women's Championship being defended, and that's uh, Nia Jax, the challenger, versus Bayley, my ultimate favorite. I had to say it. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> I, I, just, I just had to because I love her that much. But I, I'm excited for this one because, you know, Nia Jax is, is she towers over Bayley. I mean, she's, she's huge. And I don't mean that in a bad way, in a good way. And I said it earlier, it's kind of like the old David versus Goliath thing, and uh, Bailey is the underdog in this one. She's the fan favorite, but she's definitely the underdog, you know. Uh, Nia Jax has been attacking her from behind recently, and then Nia Jax also has to even Marie in the corner, and it, it's going to be interesting, you know. Uh, she put Bailey through a door a few weeks ago, literally through a door during a backstage interview, and uh, me and Trevor watched that one together, and we're like, this would have never allowed that to happen because literally Bailey got shoved through a door and the door broke down and it was like the most amazing thing ever. But you know, they're, they're finally gonna wrestle each other and I, I'm excited for this one because I want—I just want to see the size difference play out and how exactly it's gonna work and uh, it's gonna be fun. And, and you know, for people who don't know, uh, Naya is The Rock's cousin. So recently in a promo. Uh, this week on NXT, Naya was like, I'm destined for greatness. And I, I caught on to that right away. I was like, oh, oh, I see what you did there because your cousin is the great one. So I get it. 
So, I mean, a lot of people don't like Naya already. She gets booed tremendously. It's insane. I've never seen someone get booed that loud before in a long time. Uh, Bailey gets cheered everywhere she goes. You know, adults love her, kids love her. So, it's going to be a fun one just to see the ultimate male versus the ultimate face. Uh, that's definitely the, the, you know, the match that I most excited for. And then you have the main event. You have Finn Balor defending his NXT uh, title against Samoa Joe. You know, Samoa Joe is a household name. He's an indie darling as well. You know, came from uh, TNA over to WWE. And he's the one that wanted to go to NXT. He didn't want to go to the main roster again. He wanted to go to NXT and, and you know, soak up that crowd and that atmosphere. And, uh, you know, their feud has been boiling over. Um, he recently, a few weeks ago, attacked uh, Finn Balor, and, you know, Finn Balor felt betrayed because for a while they were running as a tag team, and, you know, some other girls said, I did this because I asked you, I did a lot of things for you, and I asked for one favor, and that was a title shot, and you didn't want to give it to me, so now I'm coming for your title, so Samoa Joe's hungry, but at the same time, Finn Balor, he's, he's a champion, man, and we're going to see that demon come out of him, and it's going to be, it's going to be one for the ages, and I, anybody who loves wrestling is, is definitely going to love that match, and it's a good way to uh, cap off the, the entire event. And if you haven't seen Finn Balor's ring entrance at a takeover, uh, that, that'll be worth your nine ninety nine for the month. <laughs> funny thing is, is I'm looking at the um, the lineup for tomorrow night's pay-per-view, Tables, Ladders, and Chairs, and yeah. and I see a whole bunch of matches that I could miss and never lose any sleep over. Yep. And, That's what's crazy. And I, I think about last Monday, you know, on WWE, uh, it's no secret that their, their ratings have been lower than they have in, in, in like 20 years. Uh, they they went to their fan group that they use to, you know, check the pulse of the fans. And, and we, so we were supposed to get this great Raw last Monday. Yeah, and, no. And yeah. what did they do? In the, in the first segment, they bring out... 16 of the biggest names on the roster and lump them together and lump them together right away now they re- they reused some of them later but you take the 16 biggest names and get them out of the way in the first literally half hour because 15 minutes of of fi- yeah and, and I'm I told Amy when we were watching I said well, this ought to make for a pretty boring rest of the show when they've got all the yeah. main people out here right now in, in a, a stupid four-way yeah. match with yeah. and it. yeah, and, and it, it made no sense. And, and you know who I feel the worst for is Roman Reigns. I really feel bad yeah. for him. He he should be getting a chance to see if he can carry the roster. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, maybe he can, maybe he can't. But they, it's just like somebody's got something inside him that says, we can't turn it over to Roman Reigns. We just, we just can't turn it over to Roman Reigns. It's like, look, let's find out if he can carry it or not carry it. I mean, he's over with the fans now. And let's, 
we got to deal with Seamus. And the crowd has never said a truer chant than, you look stupid. Yeah, yeah he does look stupid. And that's, and that's sad because, you know what, I used to be a Seamus fan. I won't even lie. I, I, me too. I, I like the guy. I, I met the guy. He's super sweet, super humble, loves the business. And it's like, what are you doing with him? Why? Why? Like, I mean, it's not so much that he's champion. It's just how they're building him. And it's, I just, I don't, I don't get it. Like, I, I don't understand. Like, I don't get why he has to win the money in the bank. I don't get why Bray Wyatt has to interfere with Roman Reigns winning because even that feud, it fizzled out and was completely pointless and stupid. Like, why, if you're going to give the title to someone and you don't want it to be Roman Reigns, which I don't understand because from what I thought, Roman Reigns was Vince's guy, so it's like, why are you not giving it to him? Maybe they wanted to keep, you know, the title on a hill because they had plans for, you know, uh, Rollins to, to carry it out to whoever knows how long. And, and maybe they were like, okay, let's just get the title to a hill and see if it works, but let's go with the plans we had for, for Rollins. But it just doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense. Like, why couldn't you have given the title to at least Ambrose? Turn him hill because he's going to be one show. People would love him and people would care about your product and people would watch. But now that you have someone like Seamus, and again, no disrespect because I like him, it's just yet nobody cares. No, I, I don't care. I mean, I'm just like, okay, whatever happens today, whatever happens today. You know, I just, I, like you said, I feel bad for Reigns. I feel bad for everyone. I feel bad for Seamus, too, because now he's getting, like, the brunt of everybody just hating it. And it's like, why? What are you doing? I, well, it, I, don't, I don't understand. It's the product and not the people. That, that, yeah. that, that's exactly what it is because I'm a Seamus fan too uh, but I mean he beards his I mean he braids his beard and puts beads in it I mean yeah I know and, really and you gotta he, he must have to go around like that all the time because surely you don't want to braid your beard every single day yeah that would suck and and you know our opening match. How many times in the last month have we seen Ryback and Rusev? Oh, yeah. Two million times account. Nobody cares. I know I don't care. Like, I really don't care. Like, uh, like it's just... And that's nothing against Ryback or Rusev. I know me and no. like to make fun of Ryback all the time. Like, that's our thing. That's what we do. But even him, like, he deserves far better than what he's getting. Same thing with Rusev. He was undefeated. John Cena finally beat him. Okay, that makes sense. But then what do they do with him afterwards? They just put him there and he drops to everybody. He's like, no, you're supposed to be the Bulgarian brute, you know? You're supposed to be beating the crap out of everyone. You should be demolishing everyone. And now it's like, oh, he has to get in a love triangle with, like, Summer Rae and Lana. And it's ridiculous. It's stupid. It's like, why? What are you doing? Like, nobody cares about who Rusev is quote unquote sleeping with. We want to see wrestling. We don't care about the soap opera pool, you know? It's, it's just that gross. It's stupid. And, and to me, the ultimate I don't care match is mm-hmm. Alberto Del Rio versus Jack oh, Swagger. Yep. It's like, again, how many times have we been to this? Literally, we've seen this match numerous times years ago. Why the hell is Alberto Del Rio even back in the WWE? Like, when they, oh, it was just a big, big old surprise. Like, who is it going to be? It's a fake John Cena. Everyone was thinking maybe Dan O'Brien. Now, that would have been cool. But no, they give us Alberto Del Rio. And I was just like, really, really, that's your guy? That's what we're going with right now? Because we knew Cena was going to lose because he was going to go away. That was already established. Everyone knew that. And it's like, how is this next American thing supposed to work? I mean, I kind of get it because, you know, Mexico has amazing wrestling fans, which underground is proof of that. But it's like, Alberto Del Rio is a hill, and it's not going to work that way. Like, you can't just make him a face. Like, I think even Alberto Del Rio as a person would rather be a hill than than a face, so it just doesn't work. And, like, now him and Nick Coulter are having issues, and it's kind of like, now it's all this, this USA versus Mexico thing, and okay, whatever, that might work, but... You have someone like Swagger who disappears for a really, really long time and then comes back like, oh yeah, hey, you forgot about me. They're just throwing me in there with the guy that I shoot with multiple times. The last time, Zeb was on my side and now he's on Alberto Del Rio's side. Like, that's literally the only difference in this feud. And it, it doesn't make any sense. I 
mean, so we the people thing is we've always cool. It's still is cool, so maybe that could work if if Swagger like, goes over this Sunday. But if the uh, if the chair is not, I don't I don't care about it. It's it's like a, it's a sleep fest. Like I'd rather be sleeping or doing something else. You know, well, I'm not invested in it at all. Don't get me wrong. I'm a huge. I hate to even say Zeb Coulter because that's not the name he needs to be going by. But I'm a yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. a I'm a huge fan of his. But when the yeah. when the big deal of their feud is Zeb and, and, and who you know who he's with, then it's all screwed up. I mean, Zeb's had his day, uh, and. <laughs> And Alberto Del Rio don't need a manager with him to to put him over as a heel. In a in a match He's that, already that right in a match that I would care about, other than the fact that it's jobber team versus jobber team, mm-hmm. and, and I don't say that disrespectfully to them. I can't believe that the WWE bring back the Dudley Boys, yeah. and the Dudley Boys can't beat anybody. Yeah. Yeah. It's like they're supposed to be one of the dominated, most decorated tag teams out there. You know, what, what are they, like 15 times tag team champions? For probably even more than that. And it's like, yeah, now now you're losing to the Wyatt. Okay, that that makes that makes sense in a way because it's like the Wyatt is supposed to be the next big thing. So in a way, that that's okay. But it's like the way they lose and how they lose. It's just, the well, all around is bad. It, it's just stupid. Th- they can't. Get the best of New Day, and New Day. Yeah, it, exactly. I mean, Big E, size wise and caliber wise, is is on the same level. But Xavier Woods, are you kidding yeah. me? Xavier yeah. Woods outsmarting the Dudley Boys. Now, I, I I love the I love the Wyatt family versus the ECW. You know, hardcore. Uh, with Tommy Dreamer and Rhino in there, and uh, I would care about that if I thought that they were going to do something with it mm-hmm. past this tables match. But yeah. we're going to go back to seeing the and think about the Wyatts when they brought them. They built that up so many weeks in advance, and really and they give them a good push for a little while, mm-hmm. and, and and now it's. Who are they going to job out to? To put, you got to give them credit. They put over the other teams perfect, but at some point, Bray Wyatt's gimmick is no good if he can never win in yeah. the big in the big matches. Absolutely, and that's what's frustrating. That's what I don't get either. Because Bray Wyatt is obviously supposed to be a hill, but the, the crowd is the crowd goes crazy. With the Wyatt, but the thing that I don't understand about the Wyatt is okay. You had Luke Harper, and, and you know he he was there, and then he wasn't part of the Wyatt, and now he is. And then Eric Rowan was there, and he was a part of the Wyatt, and now he is. And then the new guy, the Black Sheep, uh, what is his name? Brian Strowman. I don't know how to say his name, but that guy, like he's huge, and he has like so much potential, and he came from the next team. All these guys came from the next team. Again, I say it. The main roster does not know what to do with their talent, and they're they're ruining wrestling for people. Like TLC used to be like one of those pay per views. I mean, it wasn't one of the biggest pay per views. It wasn't like you know SummerSlam or Survivor Series or WrestleMania or Royal Rumble, but it was still something that you would forward to because it was like oh, you know the table out of the chairs, the right. But now it's like nobody, nobody really cares. It's kind of like oh yeah, yeah, these are matches that we could see on a regular Raw for free, right? You know? Exactly. We we wouldn't even have to pay nine ninety nine to see some of these matches. How many times have we seen the next match? Charlotte versus Paige. I mean, I, I think we're up to like four times now, maybe three. I don't know. It's been a while. You know, it, it's kind of like the Rocky series. We're at Rocky number eight hundred and fifty four with uh, yeah. uh, with uh, Creed, and yeah. and I don't mind if it, if it's a feud. I mean, Ric Flair had some feuds back in the day. Ricky the Dragon yeah. Steamboat, Randy Macho Man Savage, and people like that. But th- these feuds are stupid. Yep, absolutely. And, uh, they, they've forgotten how to feud. <laughs> I mean, really. And 
there's more to a feud than just cutting a promo and and saying mean things and that's it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I may have said out loud, who wrote that? I don't know. That's why I know because it doesn't make sense. Because then you had Paige come out backstage after the match with, with you know, Becky and was kind of like, I love you so type of thing. And, and now, like, on this TV last week, and that was literally the only thing I cared about on Raw, which is kind of sad, but it's true. It's the one thing that I waited for, and then afterwards, I, like, literally went to sleep. Um, but... You know, I mean, that was weird because it was like, uh, you know, you know, Charlotte was like, oh, so you're mad at me for, for taking advantage of an opportunity. But it's like, no, don't cheat it. It's like, just own up to it. Like, you know, I don't get it. Like, and, and like I said, when, when uh, you know, how Miz, like, tricked Charlotte and was like, oh, Paige isn't here. But then by the end of it, she was like, he was like, oh, I lied. Paige is here. And then she comes out and the crowd is cheering. And it's like, so wait. Are you the face of the situation? Because two weeks ago, you said some deplorable things about Charlotte's brother to Charlotte's face, and all of a sudden, you are a face, and people are cheering you and booing Charlotte because of her dirty antics against Becky. And I get why people would be upset about that, because if anybody knows Becky Lynch, Becky Lynch is amazing, and it's like, how did, why did that happen? How did it happen like that? I don't know what the direction is of this, this Diva Revolution. I don't know what you're doing with anyone. I can't remember who's facing anyone. I can't remember who's going anymore. It doesn't make any sense. I'm just like, Kim, it's just a, it's a wrestling match. And, and nobody has a real, like, purpose in this. They're just throwing people together. I, I don't get it. In the second biggest Who Cares match of the night, the New Day versus the Usos versus the oh, Lucha okay. Dragons for the... T- See, now, here's what I would like to see. Let me tell you what I'd like to see. Get the New Day out of that and let the Usos and the Lucha Dragons go for about 60 minutes is what I would like to see. Absolutely. I was just about to say that. And, and the sad thing is, uh, and, like, it's, it's not to knock Xavier and Big E or whoever decides to wrestle that day because they always count around the title, which was, you know, that, that triple threat tag team champions apparently mm-hmm. is what it feels like. But, I mean... Um, it's something against them because, again, those guys came from NXT. Those guys were amazing. Xavier was awesome. He used to come out just like a Power Ranger. Does anybody remember that? <laughs> come on. Um, I mean, I, I know I do. And, you know, and, and same thing with Big E. He was so big with heavy. He dominated people person after person. And it's like, okay, well, now they're in this, like, horrible thing. And, yeah, okay, New Day is just this comedic relief. And some people like it, whatever. But... And it's nothing against them, but like, yeah, take them out of it. But even if you didn't 
take them out of it. That match has the ability to be probably one of the best matches on the card because all those three tag teams are amazing. The Lucha Dragons, they're the ones that be throwing the attention after almost a year. And then you have, you know, the Pusos. They're amazing. Every time they're in the ring, it's like you never know what you're going to get. And then, like I said, same thing with Xavier and Big E. They're good wrestlers. They know what they're doing. Those three tag teams have the opportunity and the ability to put on a you know, match of the night. But is it going to happen? Probably not because... <laughs> No, it's because here, it's going to end up being one because of a stupid trombone or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's going to be a stupid, crooked finish, and you're just going to be like, okay, that was dumb. And, and that's the thing. WWE uh, just disregards the tag team division, and it's so sad because it's so much better. On NXT, again, crazy <laughs> NXT, but I mean, I really, I mean that. And I, I just, yeah, that's a match that could be the match of the night, but because of the way things are handled in the main roster, sadly, it won't be. I, I just, the reason I say it's a who cares match is because I know before they ever even come out from behind the curtain that they're not going to use any of those teams properly. And, yep. you know, I agree. I like all three talent wise, but you throw in the stupidity and, and you know, New Day rocks, you know, that's been, it, it, it's done, it, it's had its time. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's some gimmicks it's that are good time. for a, it's yeah, there's some gimmicks that are okay for a while, but they do that, they overstay their welcome. Now, the next match is really the only one that I'm looking forward to, and that would be Kevin yep. Owens and Dean Ambrose. Versus Dean Ambrose, yep, because... Again, those guys came from the Indies. They know what they're doing. They're wrestlers. Honestly, that that should, I mean, it should be the main event, but obviously it won't be because we have, you know, the, the championship matchup. But that should be coming event if they do it right because those two, uh, they're going to tear the house down. They have the ability to give you a barn burner. Um, they're both, both their styles and wrestling are and they have no regard for it. the human body. Like, let's be honest, they will throw anything and everything that they can at each other. And they both love the business, and they both live in great wrestling. So that match should be, if given enough time, the match of the night. I'll probably even say it probably will end up being match of the night because, yeah. I mean, I have no, I have nothing bad to say about Dean Ambrose or Kevin Owens. I mean, like I said, they could be handled a little bit better, but aside from that, there's, there's nothing bad to say about them. No, there's... Like, at all. I, I, the only thing I wish... It was something like a last man standing match or something like that, where yeah. they could just fight all over the friggin' arena. I mean, you know... I agree. Could you imagine that? It'd be amazing. There, there's some wrestlers that just don't need to be confined into the ring. Yep. And, and the way that, like, you know... Uh, Friggin' Dean Ambrose, you know, he comes off the hinges and he, like, bites the guys to the rope. Like I said, no regard for his body. Same thing with Owens. They, they don't care. As long as they're out there putting on a phenomenal match and entertaining us, that's what matters to them. They, those two are guys that will literally break their bodies for people's entertainment. And it's amazing. And like you said, I wish there was, like, a, a special stipulation. But, yeah. I mean, is, there a, is it a ladder match? It doesn't have anything yeah, attached to it? it. I don't see I don't anything know. attached to it. It's just the Intercontinental Championship. Uh, yeah, I see. That's, that's what WWE is missing the, the ball because that, it should at least be a ladder match. Gee, do something. I don't know. But, you know, what do we know? You know, we're just people. We're just fans. Mm-hmm. We know nothing. We don't know what the difference is. It's not. You know, I mean, come on. <laughs> well, and in the main event... TLC match, Sheamus and Roman Reigns. I mean, there's really not much to talk about. It's We've talked about it. Um, I'm almost embarrassed to end the show with such a downer. Yeah, because it's like there's so many great things going on. And, and like I said, you know, the UFC tonight, you have TakeOver on Wednesday. You know, 
But then it's like, oh, tomorrow, tomorrow's TLC. Can, I mean, Trevor made a joke about it earlier. Can we just, like, tell us, like, skip over, over Sunday? Because it's really not needed, you guys. Like, I don't, I don't care about it. You know. The thing is, what's funny is as much as we say we don't care about it, we all are going to watch it anyway. But, but I mean, it's true. I'm just, I'm not. Like, I don't get that feeling anymore. I'm like, oh, man, it's a pay-per-view today. Yay. Like, well, it's like, oh, whatever. I'm it's, the, it. it's the fan in us that is wanting to say, maybe something will happen during yeah. some part of this pay-per-view that is going to make us fall back in love with the WWE and that they will be the WWE that we we know and love and not this, well, you know, they need The Rock. To come in and call the WWE oh, wow. candy asses. I mean, that's what it. it, it it's can't. Exactly it's candy ass wrestling. Mm-hmm. I agree. I, I mean, I just. I mean, I remember like when Vince was doing it. of the year we are going to kick off a one hour wrestling show and it won't necessarily have to be one hour because we actually went an hour and 20 minutes tonight um and that was with nothing good to talk about with it i guess we spent our time talking about the wwe talking about how bad it is uh, yeah, yeah, that was, that was but bad. the first saturday which i think is the second is we will kick off a new show with vanessa and i uh weekly uh, and uh, we are excited about that. At least I know I am. Yeah. I know I am too. It's so funny because it's like the dynamic duo back together again. You know, like when we when we uh, when we we just band for a while. You know, when you, you went and did your own thing and I went and did my own thing. We we're like, you know, I know there's going to be a time where we're going to call on each other for help, and we we've done that. You know, occasionally, actually a lot. And like now, it's like now we have an official show together again and then Trevor producing everything you know backstage and whatnot so it's like the three of us man we're a team and I love it and I've said it before I'll say it again you guys are like family to me and I I love that we can come on here and like discuss our likes and our dislikes to people that are are like-minded and it's really fun and I'm looking forward to it I'm stoked I'm thinking that the wrestling show is going to be one of the top rated Shows of all the Ed Boston Podcast Network. Yeah, That's what I'm definitely. thinking. I absolutely agree. You know, because you have your knowledge and your expertise, and then you have my no filter, both very opinionated topics. So, I mean, together, it's, it's, just, it's like I said, it's a dynamic duo, and I think it's going to be fun for people who, you know, if they want something that you know has a great analysis, they can have you for it, and then if they want. A little like something unconventional and a little funny. That's me. So it's, it's a great combination. I'm super excited. Well, folks, thank you for being with us uh, through the sports section and then through the wrestling section. And and to us, wrestling is sports. Uh, we could go into a long dissertation, but we've already been here long enough. So for Trevor, who's in the background, for my wife Amy, who couldn't be with us tonight, and my partner Vanessa. This is Ed, and go out and do the right thing. God bless. Bye, guys.